put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Let me introduce you to my good friend Francois Duplessis again, who has a very keen interest in archaeology, typology being his speciality, relating the past to the present, and today he's going to talk about Armenia, and I accompanied him on this trip. It was very interesting. Francois. Here you stand with an Armenian in a shop. You didn't buy anything from him. He was a bit disappointed. But they call themselves Hay, and their country they call Hayastan. So what I did, I was looking at different civilizations, ancient civilizations, to pick up the name Armenia. I went to Hattusas, this is what we see on the screen, where Supiluli Umas reigned as a king. And uh, on one of the clay tablets, they mention the name of Armenia, and they call it Hayasa. Now, archaeology, by the way, Walter, does not prove the Bible to be true. It just confirms the authenticity of this marvelous book. Now, on the screen here, you're looking at the restored palace of Nebuchadnezzar, the southern palace, restored by his honorable Saddam Hussein. Wow. I've been there four times, and it's wonderful to see what happened. And you're also looking at Nineveh. I'm standing there with my daughter, where Jonah preached. It was the most successful evangelistic campaign, Walter, in history. Now, archaeologists made a marvelous discovery uh, in the vicinity of Nineveh, where they found the name Nairi, which means the land of rivers, a reference to Armenia. And uh, remember that one Friday night we went up to a very interesting fortress. That's right. It was the palace of King Argitsi. And he was a ruler of the Urartu civilization. Everything refers to Ararat when you visit this. Everything is Ar. And Noah's name is also very prominent. Yeah. Now, a King Argisti was a contemporary of Adat Nirari II. He was the king who became a converted man at the preaching of Jonah. And I discovered a few very interesting sites. On that inscription, names like Shalmaneser III and Sargon is also mentioned. Now, Sargon was the man who took the ten tribes in exile in 722. The Bible is the only reliable source of ancient literature. It is a marvelous book. I've proved it over and over. Ekbatana. I visited the ancient site of the Medes in Iran. It used to be the capital. In uh, 612, Nebuchadnezzar, his father Nabopolassar, and the king of Ekbatana, Seacharis, conquered the Armenian Empire. Uh, here is a picture of the tomb of Cyrus the Great, a type of Christ. And I'm going to do a little lecture on this great man. By the way, he was also a monotheist. In 549 BC, uh, he became the founder of the Persian Empire, and in 549, also, he became the ruler of Armenia. Now, remember the temple we visited there, the only remaining Roman temple in history. Now, remember, we saw inscriptions at that temple. And you pointed this to me, and yes. I came there. That was a Persian soldier who wrote the following words. May Aref, the sun god, protect me. He knows how to help me. That was a touching emotional prayer that we read there. Now, the first preachers of Christianity were Thaddeus and Bethlehem, the twelve from the twelve disciples. And for the first three centuries, the Christian church missionaries were persecuted in Armenia until Tiridates III adopted the Christian religion. 
And can you tell us your experience when you visited this little church on the screen? It's an amazing little place, hidden in the middle of nowhere, a tiny little Adventist enclave in the middle of devastation. And the lady that came from Azerbaijan? Yes, she was a refugee, tears streaming down her face. I remember her very well. We gave her a little gift and she started to weep. Now in 301 AD, Armenia became the first country who officially accepted Christianity. And in 405, we visited his museum. The priest and scholar Mesrop Mashots invented the Armenian letters alphabet. Would you like to say something on the Bible? Well, it's fascinating that this is one of the most ancient versions of the Bible and it confirms what we have today. It is exactly the same. Marvelous. While I look at this ancient Armenian Bible, I thought of the words of Christ. Matthew 24, verse 38, 39. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They did this excessively. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We've got to study these things to understand the second coming of Christ. Remember the visit to the Genocide Museum? Yeah. What a sad, they massacred millions of these people. Now today when an Armenian greets you, he would say, Tsafut Tanem. This means, let me share your pain. It's a land that's drenched in pain. And while I thought of this greeting, I thought of us. You know, it would be wonderful if we could share one another's pain. The Bible says, carry one another's burden. And sometimes we try and have a monopoly over our pain. Christ says, bring your pain to me. Tsafutanem, let me share your pain. Christ wants to share our pain. And Walter, let's bring our pain to him. You have some and I've got some. And the listeners have got some pain. Christ invites you to share your pain with him. God bless. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. We are now going to discuss a universal flood. Now the question of a universal flood is a major, major problem to the scientific fraternity. If there was a universal flood, which at some stage destroyed all life on earth, on solid land that is, then everything that was the product of the evolutionary process would have been eradicated at one point in time. And if you then want to continue and have an evolutionary process all the way through to its end product, man, well then you would have a gap. And so science cannot accept a universal flood because it would destroy the continuity from the very ancient features in the geological column to the very modern ones. You cannot have a gap. So science cannot accept a universal flood. Some might argue that there was a local flood because that would leave room for evolutionary continuity in other areas. The question is, why would Noah build an ark for a local flood? to preserve the animals, if the animals were going to survive in other areas anyway. It doesn't make any sense. So here we have a problem where science and religion are mutually exclusive. They eliminate each other in terms of this argument. So if there was a universal flood, then the evolutionary paradigm is destroyed. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man 
So where are we in terms of the evolutionary paradigm? Right at the end of the evolutionary process. In other words, we're dealing with the top layers of the geological column, the tertiary layers. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So here at one stage, God intervenes and destroys all life on terra firma, on solid ground. So the birds and all the creeping things and all the animals are destroyed at a stage when man was already there. So if everything was gone from the earth, that would mean you would have to start with terrestrial evolution all over again. In other words, from the first fish that crawled onto the land all the way through to man. And that, of course, is impossible. Now, the Bible says there was such a flood. Science says there was no universal flood. Maybe catastrophic events here and there, regionally, but never, never a universal flood. The Bible says in Genesis 7:11, and in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So we have two sources of water that are mentioned here. And that is the fountains of the great deep, the subterranean water, broke up and shot forth. And then there was water from the top. So if you want to know where all the water came from, the Bible gives these sources. So under great pressure and great force, the water shot forth, as we have in this illustration over here. Maybe a tear occurred around the earth or something like that. And we have evidence from the mid-Atlantic ridge and all that volcanism that took place over there. And this water shot out and spread over the land. Whatever triggered it, we do not know. Some may conject that it was an extraterrestrial event, a meteor or something that struck the earth, or it could just have been by the command of God. But here's another interesting source of water, Amos 9 verse 6. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heavens and has founded his troop in the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So we had subterranean water, we had aerial water coming down, and we have oceanic water being poured over the land. So the pre-flood earth had seas and waters. Now, if we look at these features, as we explained in the first lecture, if the pre-flood world didn't have the mountainous ranges that we have today, and then the continent was suppressed during this flood process, then it would go under the waters. And the waters of the oceans would deposit their sediment, sediments in these mud flows upon the continents. And subsequently, we would have the new continents rising with their new mountains and their new layers. And that would explain why the marine sediments are so largely concentrated on the continents rather than in the ocean basins where they should be. This is another misnomer in science. Why do we have all these massive marine deposits on land? Surely periodic uh, submersion, as science suggests, does not answer this question, because you cannot have your cake and eat it. You cannot have the very ancient layers and the youngest layers all represented on the continents and yet have periodic incursions of oceanic waters to eradicate those layers over and over and over again. The fact that they're all still there intact shows that the earth cannot be as old as science would wish it to be. So we also had this oceanic water pouring over the land. Three sources of water. So when we looked at this flood chronology again, Noah entered the ark, then this turmoil took place, and uh, the waters covered the earth. In other words, all the continents were suppressed. There were no mountains, so it's not as if the present-day mountains were covered. Then there was this uplift with the mountain formation and the folding. That's where you have all the layers that formed, as we explained in the previous lecture. And then you would have the situation 
in a rather short space of time rather than a long space of time. The question we have to ask ourselves is, was there a universal flood or not? If there was one, if there is evidence for one, then the whole scientific, scientific paradigm and the whole evolutionary scenario collapses. Well, let's have a look at the geological column. If we go to the top layers of the geological column, in the previous lecture we dealt with the bottom layers, and we move up to the top, we come to the layers which we call the tertiary, where you have the mammals and all these creatures which are considered modern. Now, just below that layer, we have a very interesting layer which is called Cretaceous. Now, Cretaceous means chalk. In German it's called Kreide, which means chalk. That's what you write with on the board. Now, what does chalk consist of? Now, there's something very interesting about this chalk layer, and that is that it is universal. Now, when we go to a more detailed map, as we have on this side over here, and we come to the Mesozoic, you'll see that the Cretaceous is just above the Jurassic. That's the time of the dinosaurs and all of these creatures. And all of a sudden, post this period, we have this massive extinction of all these major categories of animals. So here was something tumultuous that happened in the geological column. Well, if you go to the textbooks, you'll see this classical picture of these ancient oceans with their marine organisms and their flourishing biota. And right there in the Cretaceous and in these chalk layers, we have evidence for vast quantities of water that covered the surface of the Earth at the same time. If we go to the White Cliffs of Dover, we have a beautiful example of chalk deposits. Now, what do these chalk deposits consist of? Well, they consist of the microscopic skeletons of marine organisms, algae and other marine organisms that float in the oceans. And when these die, then the skeletons settle in the mud at the bottom and eventually form a layer. If you have an algal bloom, you can get these layers to form very, very rapidly, as we know in disturbed ecological environments today. So it doesn't have to take millions of years for these to form. Here are a typical example of Cretaceous materials, and you can see that they all consist of these tiny little marine organisms, some of them unicellular, like uh, foraminifera and radiolarians, marine organisms that float in the oceans. Of course, these oceans have to be shallow before these deposits will form, because in present-day oceans, which are very deep, these dissolve and we don't have these layers forming. So this is exactly what you would expect after a depression of the continents, shallow seas, and the formation in a disturbed ecology of chalk layers forming universally. The Cretaceous layers are universal, which means that the whole world was immersed underwater at the same time. There is no argument around this issue. Let us have a look at another area in the world which can throw some light on the events that actually took place. If we go to the Beartooth Mountains and the Bighorn Mountains, there's a basin between the two which is known as the Bighorn Basin. And we have the layers of the geological column represented in this area. Now it's interesting that the bottom layers are very similar to the ones that we find in the, in the Grand Canyon, for example. And we have Mesozoic and Paleozoic uh, layers over there, with the Cenozoic layers on top of that. Now what's fascinating is that the Mesozoic and Cenozoic layers are bent up on their sides, whereas the Cenozoic layers are straight without the bend. Now what does that mean? What does that tell us? It tells us that when these mountains were uplifted, when they formed, the bottom layers were there and they must have been pliable because they bent up with the mountain formation. The top layers, however, could not have been there 
and they must have been deposited afterwards. Between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, we have chalk layers. So we have the full story over here of water covering the earth, and then we have the uplift, and then the new layers are deposited on top. There's another interesting feature in this area. There's a little mountain called Beartooth Butte on the top, and uh, this mountain is of the same material as the Mesozoic and Paleozoic material that you have at the bottom over here. So how does it get to the top of the mountain over there? Obviously it's a relic. As this uplift took place, the waters washed down the material from the top, and before everything was gone, the water was gone. And that could explain this little Beartooth Butte with some of the interesting fish fossils that occur in that particular mountain. The whole range gets its name from this little tooth over here, which resembles a bear's tooth. You know, science would have us believe that everything happened over millions and millions and millions of years. So they take the layers of the geological column and they apply time to it. Millions of years of time. When we look at the basins of lakes, for example, they take the layers and they apply time to it. And everything seems to point to long periods of time. And science requires this evidence because time is what is necessary for evolutionary events to take place so that one species can evolve into another species. Well, here we have a leaf which is buried in what we call valves, layers within these lakes, which are all assumed to be seasonal, so we could theoretically count years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. But there must be other explanations as well, and science should be open to scrutiny. That's only fair. Here we have a leaf, for example, buried in such layers, and if we look at it, we'll see that there are many, many layers. There's one, followed by another and another, some 30 to 40 layers. Now surely that leaf didn't take 40 years to be buried. That would be improbable. So obviously these layers do not necessarily represent what science would wish them to present. They could be event layers, a storm, a rain, a windstorm, whatever that causes them. And this would cut many, many thousands and millions of years out of the recognized time frame. Let's have a look at another area where we have evidence for catastrophism, short periods of time, and catastrophic floods. Well, I'm taking you to Slovenia. Here we have the largest brown coal deposit in the world. Now, I'd like you to contemplate for a moment where precisely this is. This is in Europe, it's in the heart of Europe, it's not along the coast, so it's not something that could have been periodically immer immersed by marine incursions. This is in the heart of Europe, and uh, here you have these massive brown coal deposits. Now I went to visit them, being the largest mine of this nature in the world, and had discussions with the geologists there and found some very fascinating features. Here are these huge brown coal deposits, supposedly millions and millions of years old, and having formed as, well, one would explain, a forest situation where these forests grow and then become covered over time, compacting the material and then forming coal. That is the standard paradigm and the standard explanation. The catastrophic principle doesn't come into it. There was no period of marine submersion over here. It had to be such because these layers are on the top of the, of the layers, so they're considered relatively young. And we're talking about 40, 50 million years, maybe. So let's have a look at these layers and see what we can find. Well, interesting, within these layers you have mud layers, as we can see over here. And, very fascinating, here you have chalk deposits. Now this is amazing, because these chalk deposits consist of radiolarians, which are marine organisms. And what are marine organisms doing here in the heart of Europe in a period when there was no marine incursion? 
surely this smacks of catastrophism and a watery demise rather than millions of years of slow evolutionary development. And when you dig into these coal mines, what do you find? You find evidence of marine organisms within that situation. So surely these forests didn't grow under the ocean. I had the privilege of speaking to the geologists, the chief geologists of this area, and they admitted to me that when they conduct uh, you know, exhibitions and have the youth come round, they have to explain to them how these things happened over millions and millions and millions of years. Here they're holding up a piece of chalk material consisting of radiolarian skeletons, little marine organisms with their calcium carbonate skeletons, evidence that this happened in a catastrophe and that everything was covered with water at the same time. There's more than one way to look at the evidence. If you look at the actual coal material, I'm holding some in my hand over there, it's not even coal yet, it's still wood. So how many millions of years is some of this old? And how long does it take for this to form? Does it take millions of years or can petrification and coalification happen rapidly? You know, it is assumed that everything takes such a long period of time. Do you know that you find fence posts that have been put up in the last few hundred years which form coal at the bottom under certain circumstances so it doesn't take millions of years at all. Here's a piece that is partly coal and partly wood. I do not believe that it took millions of years for these to form. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. People will be skeptics. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage and believing everything continues as it did before. Nothing has changed until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There was a judgment in the past and the Bible says there will be a judgment in the future. If we can deny the judgment in the past, then we have to deny the story of the biblical fall, and the whole paradigm of salvation collapses. Either God means exactly what he says, or else we are dealing with fairy tales. Then why do some people tend to cling to religion while at the same time cling to the evolutionary paradigm? The compromise is not possible. You see, evolution implies that death was a means to creating life in the past and that uh, what we see now is an advance towards improvement and the ultimate perfection. Whereas the Bible implies that ultimate perfection existed in the past, sin caused death and pain and suffering and we are dealing with the consequences. The Bible says there will be a restoration. Moses was hated in his day, reports Time magazine, because he told the truth. If he lived in these dark times, he'd be twice as hated. This was a letter, one of the letters written to Time magazine. Precisely that is the issue. Either there was a universal flood, or there was not. If there is a universal chalk layer, then the world was covered with water at the same time. Whether we like it or not. And we cannot make it local because it's universal. Arthur Chadwick of Earth History Research Center did some interesting research and I want to share just a little bit of this research. If we go into the geological column, we can find evidence of what the water did in the past. For example, the ripple marks in a riverbed tell us in which direction the water flowed. And in much the same way, the geological features in the world out there contain evidence which tells us in which way things flowed in the past. So in the rocks we find ripple marks such as these and we can conclude in which direction uh, the waters flowed in the past. Now if you take a typical continent like the North American continent today, it will have basins, it will have riverbeds, it will have mountains, 
And if you have a mountain range, let's say you take the Rockies, which are on the one side, then obviously the water flow will be in one direction on the one side and in the opposite direction on the other side. If you have a basin, then the water will flow into the basin from all directions. If you have a river running through a particular area, on the one side it will flow from the left, on the other side it will flow to the right. That's normal. So you have all these different directional flow rates. Now, you should expect the same in every age of the continent if it was ever very similar to what we have today. But that is what you do not find. If you take various areas and you study in which direction the flow took place in the past, and you compare it to what we have today, you get a very, very different picture. For example, if you go to the Paleozoic era, which is the lowest rocks, and you map the flow of direction of the waters, we find that there seems to be a predominant flow from the east to the west, across the entire continent, which is unlike what we have today. If we go to the next age, the Mesozoic, there seems to be a reverse in the opposite direction, and not as we have it today. And if you come to the top layers, then there seems to be a movement towards the more standard patterns which we find today. Now on the South American continent, it's even more uh, prominent. We see that in the Paleozoic, there is a unidirectional flow from the east to the west. Now, what does that imply? It implies that there were no major river basins, such as the Amazon flowing in one particular direction. There would have been no mountain range. The Andes couldn't have existed, or similar mountain ranges, because how could the water have flown from one side to the continent right across to the other? And if we go to the Mesozoic, then we have the exact opposite. We have the flow from the west to the east. Now this is catastrophism. This doesn't imply slow changes in, in topography and elevation as the earth moved upon its plates. This is catastrophism. One era, total flow in one direction. The next era, total flow in the other direction. If we extrapolate this to the surface, we find to the uppermost layers, we find a return to normality. And if we extrapolate to the entire continents of the planet, we'll find that the picture fits beautifully and catastrophism has its place. I believe that there is lots of evidence for a universal flood. One point which I would like to illustrate to show this catastrophism, where in the past people would take the same evidence and apply it to long ages, as the evidence accumulated they were compelled to apply it to a short chronology. One of the areas here is the petrified forests of the world. This particular one we will find in Yellowstone National Park, where you have these magnificent upright trees, which science would conclude are upright because they grew there, they are in position of growth, petrified like that, and therefore they must be millions of years old. What is interesting is that all of these layers that we have of these petrified forests are superimposed one on top of the other. And in some, in some areas, you have up to 40 of these layers and more, one on top of the other. Now, if these trees were in position of growth, they would tell us that it takes thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of time to produce this growth, cover them with ash, produce the next layer, cover them with ash, produce the next layer, cover them with ash, in volcanic eruptions and ash uh, coverings. And therefore, there must be plenty of time involved over here. But is there another explanation? When we come back, we will look at this issue in greater detail. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. So the question we have now is, were these trees in position of growth when they were petrified? Well, I had the privilege 
of going to this area with Dr. Harold Coffin. Here we're standing in front of one of those upright petrified trees. One layer on top of the other, indicating that this could have taken a great deal of time. Here's one tree stretching through more than one layer. What's interesting, it has no branches, it has no bark, and it has no roots. So is there something else that happened over here? We also have, instead of vertical trees, horizontal trees. And what's interesting is that they lie in a particular direction. So did the trees always fall over the same way when they fell over? Well, if you analyze the various layers, we find that, uh, generally speaking, they are orientated. They're lying in a particular direction in each of the layers. When you go to modern forests, you don't have that sort of arrangement. You have sort of a radial arrangement. So something is different. Digging out one of these trees, we find something else, another clue. Here we have a tree, and it doesn't have any roots. Now surely if it was buried in position of growth, the roots should be intact. Well, the answer came when Mount St. Helens erupted. Now that was a major event, and the eruption took place in two cycles. Here we have a picture of Mount St. Helens with the lakes surrounding it. That was before the eruption, a beautiful glacier covering the top. And then the mountain erupted, but in two eruptive cycles. Now the first eruption melted the glacier and caused the catastrophic flood on the one side of the mountain. The waters cascaded down and ripped out trees and deposited them wherever the water flowed. Here we can see some of them. You can see the logs floating in the water, and these logs are already stripped of their branches. Why? Because as they float, they churn in the, water, in the waters. There was a great deal of ash and material that covered everything in that cycle, and it was a catastrophe of great proportions. Now there was another eruptive cycle about a month later, and this one was explosive, so very different from the first. Now in the first one, we only have the evidence of what water did, because there was a meltdown of the glacier. So here we are, I'm standing on some of these trees, and what is interesting about them is that they are stream orientated. They're orientated in the direction of flow, just as we have in the petrified forest. Their roots are ripped off, their branches are ripped off, the bark is stripped, and the reason for that is that they crash against each other and this strips them of their bark. Giant trees ripped out by the power of catastrophic floods. Dents forming in the logs as they bounce against each other, this strips them of their bark. Now when the eruption took place, this is a series of photographs of that event, it was a major explosion. Some register the force of it, the force of about 500 Hiroshima atomic bombs, a major event. But the blast took place to the north, whereas the floods were more uh, paramount on the south side. The mushroom cloud that formed, and it could be seen many, many kilometers away. After the blast, the forests were stripped by the force of the blast. Here we have a steam crater. There's a man down there giving us a scale. And uh, this formed instantly. Of course, giant canyons were formed as the waters ripped through these areas. And the layers that are seen over here would have been presumed to have occurred over millions of years. But it happened instantly. All of these ash layers over here also in the past could have been interpreted as millions of years of activity. But it happened instantly. Well, some of these trees were gathered in the newly forming lakes after this catastrophe and formed these mats. Some of the trees very quickly righted themselves and started floating upright. And divers went to have a look at what they could find in these newly formed lakes or relics of the old lakes. At the bottom, great heaps of bark. Some coal fields consist entirely of bark. So that could explain some of these anomalies. 
upright floating trees, so these could have been buried very rapidly. Here's one floating upright. So they took a, a sonar and had a side scan sonar to see how many trees they could find floating upright. And in one little lake, Spirit Lake, they found up to 19,000 upright trees floating in that particular area. So if we go back to our petrified forests and we look at the various layers as they were, then the trees could have been floating, mud flow of the mud flow covered them, and they were buried, some of them horizontal, some of them upright, depending on their rootstocks. And this could explain how this could have happened rapidly. So the entire formation could have happened in a very, very short time. We're, t we're talking about one catastrophic event, not hundreds of thousands of years. How long does it take for petrification to take place? Well, here we have teddy bears that are hung up in a waterfall in Yorkshire, and they petrify within anything of a few months to a year. So it doesn't take millions of years. Let me take you to a modern-day catastrophic event. Here we have uh, the island of Surtsey in Iceland. Now, Iceland is subject to volcanism and catastrophes. This island over here formed in 1963, and geologists are amazed that some of the features on this island today appear to show millions of years of time when everything happened since 1963. Well, here we are on the mainland with its beautiful waterfalls, glacial waterfalls. Iceland is a very beautiful country. And uh, there was a catastrophic flood in Iceland in 1996, one of the best recorded, which shows us exactly how such events can influence the topography. Well, today Iceland is run by naturalistic means. Hot water is the source of their energy, thermal water. Well, here we are standing on a great floodplain that happened in the catastrophe of 19. 96. And here we see some of the great glacial areas and one of the canyons, many kilometers wide, washed out within seconds. Here we see the relics of that. And here I am, and I'm on this island explaining the topography surrounding us and what happened in that area. In 1996, Iceland experienced one of its great natural flood disasters. What happened here in this area is an incredible story. On the top of that ridge over there lies the largest glacier in Iceland, some 11% of its total surface. And glaciers come all the way down, as you see in all the ridges around. And there was a volcanic eruption and one of the inland lakes, as a result of all the melted water, rose above its normal level. And then it crashed through the glacial barrier and washed out of this area through this huge ridge uh, that you see in the back there, washing a canyon three kilometers wide and bringing down huge quantities of water, washing away the bridge and uh, creating this huge floodplain. And all of this happened in a very, very short time, demonstrating the power of catastrophic floods. What we will be seeing now is an actual recording of the events as they occurred in the catastrophe of 1996.
This is one of the girders of the bridge that was destroyed in this catastrophic flood. These bridges were designed to withstand such floods, but the power of water is indescribable. Some of these amazing shots that we saw really boggle the mind. When you look at this catastrophic water as it shoots out from under that glacier and how it rapidly changes the landscape and how very quickly everything is totally immersed in water, it gives us a small idea of what could have happened during the universal flood. Now there are some very interesting things that you might have noticed. Number one, the great size of those huge ice blocks, some of them like three-story buildings, being ripped out by the power of catastrophic floods. And man feeling so incredibly small when compared to this power of nature. Another very interesting feature which you might have noticed is where they showed how these huge tumbling blocks are moved along by the forces of water and how they scrape the bottom of the, of the landscape, producing those scrape lines. Now, such scrape lines are used by science to show that the ice ages could have occurred over millions and millions of years because they believe that the glacier advanced over such long periods of time and where you have glacial advance and glacial recession, you get these stripes forming as the glacier moves. Now here you have the exact same phenomena happening in an instant. So seeing something in the rocks does not necessarily mean that it took millions and millions of years of time. The forces that lift up an entire glacial edge like that are indescribable. That volcano ripping those vast canyons within seconds. And we're talking about the largest glaciers in Europe really powerful stuff. And then the force of these blocks and how they destroy the environment and reshape it to what we have today, leaving behind giant canyons and all of this happening in a very short space of time. We do not have to assume that everything takes millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. If we want to apply the uniformitarian principle, then yes, but if we incorporate catastrophism, then no. Again, we have the choice. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, we read, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? So the coming of Christ will be an issue and will be denied by many. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Here we have the universal principle of uniformitarianism, that the events of the past can be explained by events in the present. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Now let's have a look what they deny. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water... So the creation account will be an issue in the last days, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The flood will be denied in the last days. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the Bible describes exactly what the condition of man will be in the last days. There will be a universal denial of the precepts set out in the scriptures. Creation will be set to naught, the flood will be denied, and science has to deny the universality of the flood, or else its universal paradigm of evolution would collapse. You cannot have a complete break in the record, destroying all life, and yet have evolutionary continuity if there was a universal flood. We can choose to join the scoffers. We can choose to say God's word is not true. We can choose to say that Jesus made a mistake 
when he said, and when the flood came, it took them all away. We can choose to sit on both sides of those fences, but if we choose science, we have to deny the flood. If we choose to believe God, then the flood is a reality. I believe the evidence more than adequately shows that there was a universal flood. So God's word is trust trustworthy. If there was a universal flood, then there was a universal judgment. If there was a universal judgment, then the next judgment, which will take place at the coming of Christ, which according to this text is also denied, will also take place. Then the question is, will we be, we be ready when Jesus comes? If we choose to believe him, we will be prepared because we will be able to repent and we will be able to accept the free gift of salvation which we receive from his hand. The choice is ours. Next time, we will look at bones in stones and we will see how their secrets help us to complete the puzzle of the past. <laughs>